Welcome to the Contending for the Word podcast, a podcast devoted to helping inform, educate, equip, and warn people about false teachers, false movements, and unbiblical philosophies. Now join our host for today's episode and enjoy. Well, welcome back to the Contending for the Word podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm your host for today's episode. And on today's episode, we're going to go back to something that is really foundational, talking today about the difference between error and heresy. And this is really, really important to understand the difference because as we talk about on this show, we talk about false teaching and ideologies and you know things that oppose the biblical worldview and the Word of God and what the church has taught. And so we need to understand what the term is air and what heresy means so that when we see air we know what air is and we when we see heresy we know what heresy is now some people use the word heresy simply to mean any air or falsely serious air in theology but classically the word heresy was used to describe those theological errors so serious that it would deprive one of their salvation that is how we should use the word heresy now, to be clear, air is air. Air can be serious. Air can even be small. Air is always bad and it's always to be avoided. But there are some errors that are so huge that are really cutting us off from God because we have so misunderstood him and his truth. And that's what heresy classically was used for in the church. Now, air is anything outside of what the Bible teaches. Heresy is not only outside of what the Bible itself teaches, but it's outside of what the church has taught. Now, a tree has a root structure that supports the base and the weight of the tree. Inerrancy is the root structure and the base on which the doctrine of Scripture is built. God has given special revelation of himself via Scripture and inspired his servants to record it. Christians want assurance that the Bible is a dependable source of revelation from and about God. The doctrine of inerrancy, meaning without the Bible is without error, it gives Christians the confidence that God's word is without error and entirely entirely reliable in all that it teaches. Inerrancy is a test for orthodoxy, but it is not a test for salvation. One can potentially deny inerrancy and be saved, but we need to ask the following questions. Are they inconsistent in their beliefs? Are all salvific truths are found in the Bible, but how can one trust those salvific truths without inerrancy? What if the salvific statements are wrong? Now, to be consistent in their beliefs, Christians should affirm the inerrancy of Scripture. In this part of the show today, we're going to see how inerrancy is a test for orthodoxy as we're going to view two beliefs held by the Mormon church and even Jehovah's Witnesses, as well as church history's refutation of those beliefs. And then we're going to be able to determine what our response should be to those beliefs. To these arguments today from around those who would claim the name Christian, while their doctrine is not rooted in inerrancy, inerrancy and its divine inspiration provides a contrast between true and false Christianity. Now, the doctrines of both the Mormon Church and the Jehovah's Witnesses are riddled with error and with heresy. There's no possible way in this show to cover all the breadth of them. However, two of the heirs they share revolve around the Word of God and the person and work of Jesus Christ alone. These two areas of doctrine are constantly under attack, and we would do well to examine these issues briefly and consider how Christians today should stand on the inerrant and authoritative Word of God to defend against those who falsely claim Christianity. The Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as LDS, holds an unorthodox view of the Word of God. Mormonism teaches that the Bible is correct only so far as it is correctly translated and is considered basically trustworthy according to them. The Mormons have four standard works in their religion, the Modified King James Version, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, which includes the Book of Abraham, a burial instruction in ancient Egyptian having nothing to do with Abraham. The Eighth Article of Faith in Mormonism states this, We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is correctly translated. 
They further clarify that errors do appear in the original. Renders from the original renderings from the Hebrew and the Greek. And the biggest issue is that within the delivery of the ancient text to the present day, they claim, many plain and precious things were taken away. Now, what they mean is that one way modern revelation helps clarify and even confirm the truth in the Bible is by restoring other truths that were lost. Now, none of these works, according to their official church doctrine, is considered without error and without the possibility of error. Further, Mormons have an unorthodox view of Jesus Christ. They do not hold that Jesus, the Son of God, is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, but rather they they have three separate persons. This warped view of the Trinity, it also leads to a flawed understanding of the work of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. The atonement of Christ does not atone enough for the Mormon church. They believe that salvation comes not only by the work of Christ, but also by the work on earth. And while it's not my purpose to describe all the errors found within the doctrine of the Mormon church, I believe that addressing these two dissensions to the inerrant, inspired word of God will bolster the believer in defending the scriptures against these same attacks today. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, on the other hand, they also hold unorthodox views of Christ and the word of God. Jehovah's Witnesses teach this about the Bible. Only this organization functions for Jehovah's purpose and for his praise. To it alone, God's sacred word, the Bible, is not a sealed book. And according to Watchtower, their organization's publication, they also believe as false. The Bible is an organizational book and belongs to Christian congregation as an organization, not to individuals, regardless of how sincerely they may believe that they can interpret the Bible. For this reason, the Bible cannot be properly understood without Jehovah's visible organization in mind. Now that Jehovah's Witnesses are in great error as they proclaim that the Word of God is not complete and interpret many facets of biblical truth as false. One example of the Jehovah's Witnesses view of the Bible in action is that only 144,000 according to them can be saved. A misinterpretation of the book of Revelation chapter 7 and 14. And so they officially teach, likewise, the greater Moses, Jesus Christ, is not the mediator between Jehovah God and all mankind. He is the mediator between his heavenly father, Jehovah God, and the nation of spiritual Israel, which is limited only to 144,000 members. Now, they also explain that the exact number of the little flock approved by the Father to be kingdom heirs was not known until Christ, through an angel, revealed it to be 144,000, who, according to them, had been purchased from the earth. This little flock of 144,000 kingdom heirs, then, are those from among mankind who are born again. In truth, however, the 144,000 witnesses, it refers not to the number of people saved, but to the Christians taken from the 12 tribes of Israel, commissioned by God to preach and teach the gospel, the song that they know in Revelation 14.3. Not only is this a distorted understanding of the word of God, this also presents a distorted and even a false understanding of the identity and the work of Jesus Christ. Once in a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness on the campus of Boise State University, I asked the man, what's your view of Jesus? It's a question that I often ask Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and even other people as well. And this man responded, I don't believe in the corrupt Bible you believe in. Also, I don't believe that doctrine matters. Now, his statement that he didn't believe in the corrupt Bible you believe in, it refers to his belief to be clear that the Protestant Bible is not clear or perhaps not correctly translated, which means it's also not authoritative to him. Only the Jehovah's Witness translation of the Bible to him is clear. Now, this man, interestingly enough, was on the campus of Boise State University, BSU, spreading his quote-unquote doctrine, handing out leaflets, contradicting his own statement that doctrine doesn't matter. Now, very sadly, my experience with this Jehovah's Witness is not the exception here, but the norm, as it has been with Mormons as well, who equally dismiss orthodox views of the Bible. You see, much like the Mormon church, the Jehovah's Witnesses also have a deeply flawed view of 
understanding the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's far beyond the scope of this podcast today to detail all the ways in which Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and their understanding of Jesus Christ is incompatible with the truth of the Word of God, but we're going to take a closer look at the same error made by Mormons, that Christ's atonement is not as sufficient for salvation and works are required. Without a proper understanding of the Word of God and of Christ, they are sorely lacking salvation in Christ. Christ alone, which we're going to talk about later today. Now, we're we'll also go to the early church and the church throughout history to understand better the fight for these truths that has already taken place from which we can learn to respond to the false religions of Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness. You see, because all of Scripture is God-breathed, it is useful, it is profitable for Christians and the church. As Paul instructed Timothy, so Christians today should make good use of the Word of God for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, according to 2 Timothy 3.16. In the early church, many questions were raised about the faith once and for all delivered to the saints, like in Jude 3. As the gospel spread among the Greco-Roman civilization and beyond, the task of clarifying orthodox doctrine, it became critical. So as we consider the religions of the Mormon and even the Jehovah's Witnesses, we need to understand these are not new heresies, but old ones with their roots going back to the church's beginning. Biblically-minded Christians have good biblical and even historical reasons to reject the teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons because the church responded to their teaching at the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon. So in this section of the show today, we will get a glimpse of what the early church and the councils in church history believed and fought to protect regarding the deity of Jesus Christ, as well as the inerrant authoritative word of God. Now, while throughout the first 300 years of the church, various heresies have come and gone, few, if any, of the heresies would cause significant issues like those of Arianism. Arius, who lived from 256 to 336 AD, he was a presbyter in the Alexandrian church. He argued that God is, by nature, essentially uncreated and owes his existence to nothing else. That being so, Arians argued that the Son cannot be God because he owed his existence to something else, the Father. And if the Son was begotten by the Father, then there was a time when he did not exist, which is hardly compatible with being God. However, how can there be two gods? Arius' belief centered on how the Son of God was not divine, but rather a creature, a mere created being, or an archangel. Well, of course, this caused conflict in the church because the church taught that Jesus was both truly God and truly man, as Paul explained in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, which says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, the Council of Nicaea was called to deal with the issues raised by Arius' excommunication, also to settle the meaning of what exactly was considered orthodox. Also part of the Council of Nicaea, Athanasius, who lived from 295 to 373 AD. He was a bright and even a dynamic leader of the Alexandria Church, standing as a fierce defender of the orthodox doctrine of Christian faith against Arianism. This man had a strong faith and a sharp mind. His argument was based on the belief that the Father and the Son are one, according to John 10.10. 10. Athanasius is a key player both in defending the Word of God and the deity of Jesus Christ. Athanasius argued that the divine will has nothing to do with the decision of the will. Jonathan Hill writes, It is the nature of the Father to beget the Son, just as it is in the nature of the Son to be begotten. This essentially means that the divine nature itself exists in this way, on the one hand, begetting, and on the other, begotten. Athanasius was heavily persecuted throughout his life for upholding the Trinity. Christianity is indebted to Athanasius' boldness and to his work at the Council of Nicaea and the clarification and defense of the Nicene Creed. 
at Nicaea, it was distinctly clarified that what the church would believe in Arius's views were soundly rejected. Inerrancy and the authority of scripture became the foundation by which Christians were able to make clear distinctions between what was and what was not orthodox. And as the church began to form, more attacks came against it, so the need to clarify precisely what was scripture became even more critical. And so to determine what scripture was, they used a test. First, the writer had to have been with Christ during his earthly life. Second, they had to have been apostles, those who believed to have been commissioned by Jesus Christ himself, and thereby apostles Peter, John, and Paul were authorized to spread his teachings. This standard of rooting doctrine to scripture that was authoritative inspired is one that would be foundational for the church in the years ahead. However, the argument for the deity and the divine nature of Jesus Christ had not reached its end with Nicaea. The Christological controversy raged between two of the most influential churchmen of the East, Cyril of Alexander, who lived from 376 to 444 AD, and Nestorius, who lived from 386 to 450 AD. He was the patriarch of Constantinople. Dr. Gonzalez writes, this debate primarily revolved around who Jesus was. Was he fully God and fully man or not? Nestorius insisted Christ had two natures, while Cyril, branding this belief into Christ, said he had only one. Likewise, Dr. Hill writes, the Western Church stepped into the situation when Leo, Bishop of Rome, wrote a famous letter to Flavian known as the Tome, in which he approved of the condemnation of Euchides. Leo spoke of the two natures of Christ, one divine and one human. He taught that even after the incarnation, Christ retains these two natures, but he remains a single person identical with the second person of the Trinity. This Christological controversy, it was settled at the Council of Chalcedon. In 451 AD, Emperor Theodosius called this council into session, and the council approved of Bishop Leo's teaching from the tome and put forth the Chalcedon Creed, an expression of the Nicene Creed. Jonathan Hill explains this creed agreed with Cyril that Christ was one person identical with the pre-existent son. Still, it also agreed with Leo that after the incarnation, he possessed two distinct natures, one human and one divine. And while we have only skimmed the surface of the work done to establish in the church both the deity and the divinity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, what we're talking about here, it shows that these arguments are not new. The Christian church has a long history of defending the truth of the identity and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says to young Timothy, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, the, Paul's point here is that the Holy Spirit, through the testimony of himself, recognized the Old Testament as authoritative. Now, later, the church considered the whole of the New Testament completed and closed. The word breathed out by Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, it means that Scripture owes its origin and its content to the divine breath of the Holy Spirit and is found throughout the Word of God. That is to say the human authors were guided and even directed by the Holy Spirit, so what they wrote is not only without error, but it's impossible for it to err. And so the Scriptures are of supreme value for man because they are all the Lord wanted the Word to be. The scriptures alone constitute the with error and without the possibility of error, rule of faith and practice for the people of God. Now, the word canon means to stand or to rule. The canon is a list of authoritative and inspired scriptures. In Protestant Christianity, the canon is the body of scripture. And that constitutes the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 in the New Testament. Athanasius was the first to recognize what is now the 27 letters in the New Testament. The first list, which has come down to us, of the 27 books which we embrace, only those which appear in our New Testament, is in a letter written by Athanasius, Bishop of Alexander, Alexandria in 367 AD. Dr. La Tourette says it was not until after that date that uniform agreement on the list was found among all the teachers in the Catholic Church. By at least the end of the second century, a body of writings embracing a majority of the present 27 was being regarded in the Catholic Church as the New Testament and was being placed alongside the Jewish scriptures. 
in order for the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon to be able to tackle the discussions of the Trinity and even Christology, the church had to come to a consensus re regarding the contents of the canon and its close. Now, the councils knew then, and we know now, that their consensus on the matter did not close the canon. That was the work of the Holy Spirit alone. And yet, in order to protect and defend the authority and errancy of the Holy Word of God, it was acknowledged and solidified. One of the men who caused the initiation of the church's effort to acknowledge widely the authority and the completion of the canon was Martian of Sinope in 85, who lived from 85 to 160 AD. To Martian, the Old Testament God was a God who chooses only a particular people because he's vindictive in punishing them. So, to Martian, Jehovah is a God of justice and arbitrary justice. Martian put the Old Testament aside in favor of the New Testament. The parts Martian didn't like, well, he just changed it. The only scriptures recognized by Martian were the epistles of Paul and the Gospel of Luke. Now, the Mormons and even the Jehovah's Witnesses are guilty of Martian's error because they retranslate or add to the Bible to suit their theology rather than believing the Bible as a reliable, sufficient, authoritative, and trustworthy source of doctrine. Now, while it's outside the scope of this show today to respond to the entirety of the reasons to accuse both the Mormon Church and the Jehovah's Witnesses of error and heresy, we've examined two of the grave errors that their religions have made regarding Jesus and the Word of God. And I've also briefly viewed a, a few of the actions taken in church history to prevent these heresies from entering the Christian doctrine. Now, in light of the clear and sufficient Word of God, what should be our response to these false sects claiming? Claiming the name of Christianity. Well, let's talk about that now. And so when we consider, for example, the teaching of Mormonism, we can learn how they believe that extra books are needed alongside the Bible to provide clarity for their beliefs. Now, as Protestant Christians, we reject such teaching because the Bible provides a warning not to add to the words or the meaning of Scripture the now canonized 66 books of the Bible in Revelation 22, 18 through 19. Further, as stated by the Westminster Assembly in 1646, we believe the clarity of Scripture entails those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture or the other that not only the learned but the unlearned in due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. And so what these two cults claim is true, which is not found within the confines of Holy Scripture, prevents them from rightly understanding salvation, which is at the heart of the matter. Biblically rooted Christians reject the interpretation of Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons because they believe differently about what constitutes the Word of God, and thus about the person and work of Jesus Christ alone, among a whole host of other topics. Now, at the heart of both the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism are different views of the Bible and how one can be saved. Now, in the case of Mormonism, the belief is that we know that it is by grace that we're saved after all we can do, they teach. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, similarly to the Mormons, in that they state that salvation is by faith and what you can do. Now, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses not only have the wrong view of the Bible, but because they also have the wrong view of the Bible, they have the wrong view of the person and work of Jesus. And at the center of Scripture is a person and work of Jesus Christ alone. See, during the 4th century, Augustine was considered one of the church's great theologians. He and Pelagius fought a, a battle over God's grace. And through Augustine, we have the Confessions of St. Augustine, a truly remarkable piece of literature that testifies to the grace of God in Christ alone. And so the argument between Augustine and Pelagius was one Dr. Truman rightly identifies as one of sin, grace, and predestination. Now, the central issue of the battle between these two men was the idea of freedom. See, to Pelagius, Christianity was a religion of merit, and thus man was ultimately responsible for his actions. Augustine's point was different because to him, grace now makes the, the fallen will free again by instilling a love for righteousness. Therefore, without the proper belief and understanding of grace and the work of Jesus Christ as both truly God and truly man on our behalf, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, they're left with a warped view of salvation, which depends on their own works, not faith alone by, grace of, by the grace of God alone. Now, B.B. Warfield writes, 
in proportion as the grace of saving God in Christ is obscured or even passes into the background. In that proportion, B.B. Warfield says, does Christianity slip from our grasp? Christianity is summed up in the phrase, according to 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world with himself. B.B. Warfield concludes his comment saying this, where this great confession is contradicted or neglected, there is no Christianity. B.B. Warfield is right. His statements regarding Orthodox confession of Christianity, they help highlight with abundant clarity the main differences between biblical Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mormons, stating that salvation is by all you can do in addition to Jesus' salvific work as Mormons teach, or stating that salvation is by faith alone and all you can do as the Jehovah's Witnesses insist, it creates a different religion entirely than biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is a revealed religion Religion whereby God, as 2 Corinthians 5.19 states, has revealed himself in Christ alone. You see, in the incarnation, what we see is Jesus, truly God and truly man, came on a rescue mission under a death sentence to save sinners, according to Matthew 1.21. At the cross, Jesus said, it is finished in John 19.30. Now, Jesus pleads the merits of his own blood on behalf of sinners, and they are saved. Now, ascended, Jesus served as high priest over his people, living to serve as their advocate, according to 1 John 2, 1, and intercessor, according to Hebrews 7, 25. This is the holy and the divine Jesus, God the Son, revealed in the inerrant living word of God. Neither Jehovah's Witnesses nor Mormons are Christians. Mormons ran a recent ad claiming they're Christians, but if you ask a Mormon if they are Christians, or a Mormon, they're going to tell you they're a Mormon. Jehovah's Witnesses proclaim something similar. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses hold neither to orthodox views of the Bible nor orthodox views of the person and work of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? It means our view of the Word of God matters. The clarity of Scripture teaches us that the Bible matters because it shows us the truth about God, who has revealed himself as the great I Am in Exodus 3.14. Seven times in the Gospel of John, the Apostle shows how true this is, highlighting Jesus' I Am statements. The I Am God of Exodus 3.14 is now the incarnate Son of God and the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. See, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians because they have the wrong view of the Bible and thus the wrong view of God and the person and work of the Lord Jesus. Biblical Christianity grounds itself in the truth of all the Word of God teaches. Scripture is clear as the morning sunrise testifying of the glory of Christ's incarnation and his return at the sunset of redemptive history. See, the grace of God is not something we deserve, as Pelagius taught, nor is it something that we can do the, all that we can to earn, as Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Instead, when the grace of God is contradicted or neglected, there is no Christianity. See, Christ is all and all throughout the Bible, from the first words in Genesis 1 to the last words in Revelation 22, Jesus is the centerpiece. The whole purpose of Scripture is to teach and to proclaim God's whole counsel to his people. See, all of God's word in the word of God were given by God himself and are thereby important and inspired and binding on and enough for Christians. All of the word of God is reliable, sufficient, authoritative, trustworthy, and clear, which means that all of scripture ought to be studied, taught, proclaimed, and enjoyed by Christians so they can learn about God, his ways, and especially about the person and work of the Lord Jesus. The errant teachings of both the Jehovah's Witnesses and the LDS Church ha have been clearly dealt with throughout church history. We do not need to reinvent the wheel when ministering to Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. Instead, we need to be faithful to understand and communicate the Word of God that it is not confusing with regard to the person and work of Jesus Christ, but clear and binding. Now, you see, inerrancy is not only an issue facing the church, it's also one that's under attack from cults. Doctrine not only matters, it's essential, and Protestant Christians have significant and even profound differences with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. And central to those differences as it pertains to our show today is how we view the Bible as Protestant Christians. Protestant Christians believe the whole Bible, the 66 canonized books, are the reliable, sufficient, trustworthy, authoritative, and binding word of God. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, they don't believe this, and so they retranslate the Bible. They modify it by adding to or taking away from it. 
And as previously stated, inerrancy is not always a test for salvation. However, their glaring erroneous views of Jesus Christ and his work are a test for their salvation. And without repentance and a turn to the true Christ found in the Holy Word of God, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are lost and dead in their trespasses and sins. We can stand on scripture which cannot fail both to defend it and to show them the way. Now, as we wrap up today, let's let's conclude on this note. The charge of heresy is a very serious one. We cannot be trivial or frivolous in throwing around the term. But Paul's response to the Judaizers, among other passages of Scripture, it teaches us that there are times when we must draw clear lines of separation, even among those who would call themselves true Christians. If faithfulness requires that you do so, it's going to be vital for you, critical for you, to ask the questions as we've talked about them today. Ask them, what do you think, who do you think Jesus is? What do you think of the Bible? If you believe a particular teaching warrants affirmative answers to those questions, you need need to make a clear case for why that is so. And at the end of such an exercise, it's important for me to say that I understand we're not saved by believing in sound doctrine per se, but by believing in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. We are indeed saved by grace alone, the faith alone, and Christ alone, not merely by confessing faith alone. Nevertheless, the moment we ask, say by what, by faith in what, we must respond with a doctrinal answer. We're not saved by believing sound doctrine, but the faith by which we are saved must of necessity be doctrinally sound. And so may you and I, as children of God, may we be found faithful stewards of the pattern of sound words entrusted to us as a treasure, according to 2 Timothy 1, 13-14, for the purity of the gospel and the glory of Christ. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of the Contending for the Word podcast. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Contending for the Word. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, and follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, or X. We appreciate your support.